Okay, hello everyone. Good evening and welcome to this Arboricultural Association webinar. My name is John Parker, Technical Director at the Association here in Stonehouse in the UK and I'm your host for this evening. Please say hello in the chat, let us know where you are and please remember to select all panellists and attendees. If you have a question for one of our speakers, then please submit it using the Q&A button, otherwise I might not see it if you post it in the chat. Any moment now, I'll be handing over to our first guest. But before we do that, as ever, there's a couple of notices for your attention. Next week, we are very excited and uh, just a tiny bit nervous to be bringing you an extremely special event, which we have called Let's Discuss Trees, an evening with Ted Green. Now, over the course of the 35 webinars we've done so far, I think that Ted has been mentioned more often than any other person. There's a very good reason for that as you'll hopefully see if you join us next week. Ted is an absolute inspiration to many of us, uh, but he's also a complete liability. And as far as I'm aware, he's never actually used Zoom before. So whatever happens, we should have a very interesting evening for you. As you might have gathered from the title, Let's Discuss Trees, Ted's really keen to make this a conversation as well as a presentation. So please have a think about anything you might like to raise, basically anything at all about trees. And then you can either submit your questions as normal, or if you like, you can email me in advance, john at trees.org.uk, and we'll try to get some of you on screen to give your thoughts direct and to give you the opportunity to interrupt Ted. So that's next week and the link to register I think has already appeared in the chat. Now one of the many things that Ted's been up to recently was persuading Lynn Body, David Humphreys and Chris Wright to put together their new fungi books and I believe he also had a hand in getting the Arboricultural Association to publish them. We've sold lots of these books already and we're expecting them all to be delivered to us here in just a couple of weeks so that we can start sending them out to you. However, I'm a very lucky boy because I've been sent a couple of advanced copies of them, which I'm going to show you now. Look at this. Look. Oh, so pretty and shiny. And look at those. That's the wrong way around. They're amazing. They look even better than I thought they would. It's all terribly exciting. I think you're going to like them a lot. You can get your order in on the website now. Finally, on the same theme, please remember that on March 31st, we'll be holding an all-day online fungi symposium. 11 experts and 10 presentations, one about each of the chapters of Limbody's new book, Fungi and Trees, Their Complex Relationships. And you can find out all the details about that on our website. But in summary, if you want to attend the daytime sessions, there's a fee of £25 for AA members and £50 for non-members, which also buys you exclusive access to those sessions for six months afterwards. But the evening session is a normal Wednesday webinar, which means that it's absolutely free to everyone. Something else is absolutely free to everyone. See how this all links together seamlessly? Honestly, it's, it's harder work than I make it look, I promise. Uh, another free thing is our next Women in Arboriculture networking event tomorrow evening from 6.30 until 7.30 UK time. And you can register for that through the link that I'm sure will also appear. There it is. Look at that in the chat. Thank you, Sophie. So on to business. As you've hopefully learned by now, here at the association, we're always keen to bring you the most interesting projects and speakers from all over the world and to see what ideas and experiences we can share with our friends and colleagues across the globe. We've all got so much to learn from each other. This evening, we're very lucky to have two speakers who are going to give you their perspectives on our boriculture in East Africa. We'll soon be hearing from Kathy Watson in Nairobi. But first of all, it is my great pleasure to welcome Paddy Daniel live from Kampala to the stage. Paddy, it's over to you. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be on this platform and to share with all the people across the world the amazing work Kampala Capital City Authority is doing in terms in line with urban forestry management. I am Paddy Daniel from Kampala, Uganda, Kampala Capital City Authority. I lead a team of 10 urban foresters uh, to conduct and manage the city trees. Tonight, in you, tonight, as in Kampala and across the world within your time zones, I bring to you what Kampala is doing. The Urban Tree Audit and Forest Management Plan for a Sustainable City. In the field of agriculture, we all understand that agriculture is the management cultivation of trees and urban forestry is one of the branches of our culture. Here in Kampala, 
uh, with a team of foresters under the landscape department, we embarked on understanding our trees. Allow me to take you briefly on what I'm going to present to you tonight. We'll get to understand Kampala Capital City. You'll understand the challenges Kampala Capital City face. You'll also understand the urban forest mining plan. You'll, you'll understand the tree audit project that I am happy to share with you, its findings. I know most of you are anxious to know uh, about this green city. Uh, what is it composed about? And so I'm happy to present to you this uh, under a theme, Kampala Tree Audit Project. You also understand the urban forest management, how Kampala is, uh, what Kampala is doing about it and how they plan to sustain it to enable us achieve one of the very many goals, the system development agenda, um, 20, uh, 2030. I also delve into urban forestry in East Africa, the prospects that, uh, that East Africa has. Allow me to go to the next slide. So Kampala, established as a municipality in 1947, then became the capital of Uganda as of independence in 62. It has a population of 1.6 million residents and a daytime population 4.5 million. This daytime population, these are people who uh, move and work in Kampala for across from, uh, from the metropolitan. Um, it is projected by that by 2040, Kampala will have a population of 10 million people li living and working in Kampala. Kampala contributes 60% to the national GDP, being it, it's uh, the economic hub and the heart of the country. It contributes 60% of its GDP. Its area stretches as much as 180 square, 89 square kilometers. Kampala as a city, it has a lush green form. Uh, it's a lush green attractive. And so most scholars of uh, they have concluded that it's the garden city of Africa. Actually, if you're privileged enough, I know most of you who have traveled and got a chance to come to Kampala, it speaks for itself. It's managed by, the, by an administration uh, through the Act of Parliament, the uh, Kampala Capital City Authority, um, with a vision to ensure that it, Kampala becomes a vibrant, attractive and sustainable city. Uh, in delivering, as it delivers quality services to the city dwellers. The challenges Kampala face, the number, quite a number of them. Let's talk about urban, uh, rapid urbanization. This, I know, is a challenge that most cities across the world face. Kampala is not unique to that challenge. And so the number of remedies that are being put in place to ensure that it's mitigated Incoherent development patterns talk about um, developing development in areas that are not supposed to lakes, maybe swamps, around swamps, uh, which are most likely supposed to be, most likely supposed to be uh, conserved uh, by diversity loss, urban sprawl and growth. However, by diversity loss is what this presentation is all about and how Kampala is working around the clock to ensure that this is mitigated and not go to the extremes. Air pollution as well. I know it's also a challenge in most cities. Kampala is not unique to it. When we talk about sustainable development, uh, it's development that, the development whereby the future generation, the present generation, the present generation does not comprise the benefits of the future. Uh, it cuts within the principles of environment, economics, social, and institutional. However, if we talk about environment, environment, you realize that all the other principles, environment is a very fundamental principle. If you damage the environment, you damage the social aspect, you're damaging the economic aspect, and you damage the institutional aspect of any society. And so, it is very important that the environment aspect is always taken care of. And so uh, 
Uganda being a signatory to a number of protocols uh, way back from the Rio Convention, the, uh, the Rio Convention, looking at uh, United Nations Framework on Convention on Climate Change, by looking at um, uh, Convention on Desertification, mentioned here I feel. However, the latest convention, uh, the latest, one of the latest international agreements that Uganda is signatory to, is a sustainable goal, uh, agenda, goals and agenda, which guides uh, us and uh, uh, countries to develop sustainably. And I will not go deep into all the sustainable development goals. However, allow me to uh, delve much into goal 11, goal 13, and goal 15. Our actions in Kampala, Kampala has put in a number of interventions to ensure to see that we are the city, create a sustainable community within which urban dwellers enjoy and maximize the output. Climate action, yes, it's a, it's a, it's, it's it, a kind of uh, uh, agenda that is moving on everyone's lips, whether everyone needs to do something small to ensure that, to see that we mitigate and adapt to this challenge of climate. So Kampala, is also, Kampala has also put a number of actions. Uh, one of them is the urban forest management. Life on land, Goal 15 life on land, urban forest management and protection of all the green infrastructure helps Kampala to be a contributor to this goal. Talking of urban forestry, uh, we all know that urban forestry uh, is the management of trees, groups of trees within, groups of trees and natural ecosystems within and around urban settings, Most, uh, especially to maximize their present and future potential contribution. So, uh, physiologically, so, uh, sociologically, economically, and aesthetically. So, uh, in understanding, in appreciating these values that trees provide to the society, Kampala initially did not have a database in which it would then uh, try to guide and direct the, the, uh, direct the way it would manage its urban resource, urban forest resource. So Kampala as a city decided to first understand its resource by conducting a tree audit. Yes, the tree audit in, in similar terms we could uh, speak of something to, uh, to do with understand, um, assessing of the, of, the, of the treasury assets uh, to understand the risks, the health conditions, and its retention value. So Kampala went ahead to first try to understand the resource, the, risk, the, 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 the risks the trees pose to the community, the condition the trees are in, the stock itself. So why did we go to try and understand our trees in Kampala, as I've mentioned, to take tree stock. How many trees do we have? Where are they located? Where don't we have tree? Where do we have uh, a deficit of trees? And what can we do about it? And also as, uh, assess the tree health risks. Estimate carbon. If I talk, if I talk of estimate carbon, uh, that directs uh, the carbon stock. Direct links to action number thirteen of the sustainable goals. Uh, whereby uh, the world set an agenda to, to see that we do not allow the global temperatures to raise beyond 1.5 degrees. So if we try and increase the carbon sinks, so Kampala wanted to, uh, wants to un wanted to understand how much carbon stock they have, the carbon sink they have, and how much they could increase. Also, they need to create a database. Initially, we do not have a database where of our trees. Um, so Kampala as a city decided to part of the project to go ahead and create a database. So each and every tree that we assess, we georeference them. And so we have a database that we can always refer to. This database also helps us to try to serve the clients much better. If um, we have a client that's seeking permit, um, a permit to trim their trees, 
we do not we first check into our database to see that where is that relocated, when was that data collected? Do we need to to do we need to to go and reassess it? All oh, the data is is of, is of recent, so that database normally helps us to serve the class much better. And also the most important reason why we conducted the audit, of course, the urban first mining plan, that I will be privileged to take you through what Kampala has set to achieve with this plan. Yes, uh, so the tree audit project started as a pilot within, Kampala is made up of five divisions. Uh, that is Makinje, Kololo, uh, sorry, Makinje, Rubaga, Kawempe, Central, and Nakawa. Those are the five divisions that make up Kampala. And it's the 189 square uh, kilometers. So the pilot started up with the, with the Central Division to understand uh, first with the roads. Then later on, we had a project uh, that was in 2016, all uh, in 2016, uh, funded by the European Union. Uh, this would cover the four precincts of Kampala. The four precincts, Kampala is made up of 29 precincts. So for right, right now, we have, uh, that, project, that project only covered only four precincts. And in these four precincts, we are able to capture information on every tree that is standing within the precinct. Like it's a complete survey, a complete inventory within the four precincts, be it public, be it private, be it the road reserves, be it the schools, be it the hospitals. So we, could say that we did a complete survey and we're capturing 25 parameters. Um, the species of the tree, the height of the tree, the diameter of the tree, the crown, the health status, the age, we estimated them, the location and the GPS coordinates of each and every tree. So we're georeferencing each and every tree. Yes, when that took us 24 months to conduct, uh, roughly two, two years, this later on was much appreciated by the, by the administration. So we say to elevate it to cover the entire city. However, to cover the entire city, we, decided, uh, we have decided to start auditing each and every road reserve within the city. That means we're remaining with four more divisions to cover. Four more divisions, and, uh, four more divisions and 21 precincts to cover. So currently the audit is ongoing in the Kawumbe division. And um, yeah, uh, they, uh, as you see the map some below there, the Kawumbe division, we have covered quite the, uh, that audit's kind of, uh, it's at 70, 72% as of late. So we have green, uh, we have covered enough ground with the team. Yeah, so, um, so the, the, the findings from the four persons uh, was very astonishing that everyone that participated couldn't believe what they were saying. So uh, out of the four persons, that's Kololo, uh, Nakasero, Makere and Mulago, we had 53,268 trees uh, within that area. And so when we conducted analysis, we found out that we, four, we had 13 trees per acre or, 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 or within that area. And the diversity, actually what was more astonishing was the diversity of the trees we have. The city um, is proud to show the world that we had 306, th uh, 326 species that was captured within this area. 80% were exotic and only 20% native. So alarming. If we are to, to achieve one of the sustainable development goals, let's say um, talk of hunger, you know what the native trees uh, do. Some of them are food, uh, are food, are food to the actual sources of food. Uh, some of them are also important by the vast conservation. So you realize that if we have less of native trees and more of exotic trees, there's a problem. There's a very big problem. That means some of our bird species, um, our mammals, want to have what to feed on. Uh, but this can be explained by also our pre-colonial days, 
and also can also be explained uh, by also people's preferences. People are now preferring more aesthetics, aesthetic trees, other than agroforestry, other than um, trees that uh, do not trees that do not appeal to them. People are not going to my them. Actually, out of the 326 species that we captured, the graph below there you see there is showing you the 10 commonest. You realize out of the 10 commonest species there, you realize you have on uh, maybe 20% of the first 10, oh no, 10% of the first 10 uh, uh, native uh, with Restonia regia, uh, that's the royal palm, being the most commonest, uh, most commonest uh, aesthetic um, species that people yearn for. It's a palm tree. People know my, I think because it, uh, it's, it has less maintenance and also it's cylindrical ball, uh, people tend to go for dry Estonia. Um, yes. Uh, then you realize the most commonest species is the Pasi Americana. This is a fruit, a fruit tree. Uh, this was measured just at within the residential areas, the residential areas, the lower uh, where we have more of residential than commercial. Uh, for areas that we have more of residential than commercial, that is Makere present. Uh, Rector's residences, hostels, and also the surrounding communities that benefit from the university. Uh, then you realize that uh, Mangfere Mang Indica was also uh, scoring high. That's a, the mango, so a fruit tree. Also within, this one was also found mostly within the private residences. Um, the audits also, as you see, there's a, that picture you're looking at there, the, the big tree you're seeing there. That, that one's called in, in tandem of fragma angolensi. Uh, in, its English name is called Budong Mohogane. Uh, the uh, people who have visited Uganda are familiar with Budongo forest. Uh, it's one of the natural forests that we have in this country, uh, most, most especially it's known for conservation purposes. So that species is called the Budongo Mohogane. It's prominent in Budongo forest. So Kampala, uh, we, during our audit, we found it and there are not very many. There are not very many. Actually, if you realize the population from the, 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 the population of the trees, of that tree, uh, from the 53,268 trees, you'll realize we had done something like that, less than 10 of them within the city. So that means it was maybe planted a long time ago and they're all mature, they're actually uh, that size, most of them, all, all the time. And so during our audit, we found 13 protected species. Remember, uh, and these ones are uh, protected under the ICU, IUCN Red List and also societies, uh, Convention on Trade of on Endangered Species. And so among the 13 protected species, of course, 10 of them were, 10, 10 of them are indigenous. Uh, they're indigenous species. Talk of the uh, Melissa excelsa, that's the, Movu, uh, that's the Movule. Uh, talk of the, of course, the Budong, Budong Mahogane, uh, Internum Fragum Angolense, Internum Fragum uh, Cylindricum. Mention them. Uh, yes, our the audit also got something very interesting. The tree health. 88% of our trees are healthy. This is attributed to uh, the city's proactive nature of managing the trees. Uh, whereby trees, uh, uh, every sick tree is given attention. If the tree is dangerous and it's... Um, this is infested. There are remedies that are put in place to, to see that the trees regain their health. Where the tree cannot regain its health, of course, we red flag it for removal and hence replacement plant. Replacement planting is uh, done to ensure that we do not lose the tree cover. And only 6.7% of our trees are unhealthy, found unhealthy, 4.3% declining. And 0 0.1 was found between, 0 0.1 was either dying or dead. That shows you also that most of our trees uh, we kind of give attention to. 
for, so for the unhealthy ones, and for the unhealthy ones, we normally encourage good care in order to harness their benefits uh, that we could get from them. The audit, further, when looked at the age of the trees, of course, majority of our trees realized we're young. The being young, look at between 14, uh, between zero and 14 years. And this squad, uh, uh, this is where the, most of the, the young trees were. Um, this shows that uh, we have a very healthy tree cover in that if we have more of the young than the old, that means the forest is not, uh, the urban forest is not at a risk of becoming obsolete in the near, in the near future. And so this also shows that the, uh, the effort and the energy the city authority is putting in place to ensure that we are doing mass, uh, whereby we do massive planting. We are, yes, uh, Kesey was, uh, Kesey as, uh, as an authority came into force in the year 2010. And so between 2010 and now, those are 10 years, shows you how much effort we have put in place to plant more trees. Actually, we encourage that every small space within the city, we do planting. Of course, this is done with site matching from the experts, the, the foresters, the city authority has. And so, yeah, that is where you see that, uh, that kind of reverse J-shape curve. Uh, for if you go further into the graph of the age, you realize you have less of old trees. Uh, this shows you, of course, maybe a lag in management, whereby our mature trees were being lost due to uh, development, rapid urbanization. So for the trees that were in areas previously uh, uh, open spaces, developers tend to uh, cut them down to ensure uh, to, to give them space for development. However, that is being harnessed by all in, 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 in my presentation, I'll show you how we are curbing that. There are a lot of remedies we are putting in place, uh, looking at laws, um, of course, currently we are drafting a green infrastructure ordinance. I'll explain to you in my next slides to try and curb that uh, that loss of mature trees as a result of urban spiral growth. Yes, the milestones that the tree audit comes with uh, as for Kampala. It has given the institution um, information. They, uh, they're saying that with that data, you're just another person with just an opinion. So the tree audit gave us information and data. This data then gave, um, enabled the city authority to, inf uh, to make informed, uh, informed policy. That's the green infrastructure ordinance. This, in, this ordinance helps, uh, is going to help uh, plug the gap. You know, you know we, have the na we have national laws, but we realize these national laws, they're like the National Tree Planting and Forest National National Tree Planting and Forest Act, 20, uh, 20, uh, 2003, the National Environmental Act. Uh, we realized they were not that biting to what we want to achieve uh, to our agenda as Kampala, and so the Green Infrastructure Ordinance comes in as comes in to fill the void within the national laws. So it's like a bylaw for the city that is only binding within the physical boundary of the city. Beyond the city, it doesn't bind. So Kampala as a city decided to make a green infrastructure ordinance. In it, the number of legislation we are, uh, we are, we are bringing forward, currently it's just past first reading, it's, it's in spending second reading. Or we had hoped that by this time it would have passed, but because of we, have, we are just coming from an election, so the city authority, uh, the Lord Mayor, and his councillors were still within the campaign. So, but we hope uh, mid this year, they will pass the ordinance. So this ordinance gives us that, uh, will then give us powers to curb the illegal cutting of mature trees, um, development around swamps, uh, wetlands, which are supposed to develop for as urban, uh, combat as urban parks, the road verges and the like. And so the green infrastructure, uh, sorry, the, Tree audit, in addition to that, enabled the city authority to do an online tree directory. This directory uh, constitutes of a gallery of all the tree species we have 
uh, identified within the city as, as of date. And so it has images, it has locations, and also benefits how to propagate a, a given species. Uh, it's, a, it's a tool or, and a platform we have developed to inform our citizens of the benefits and the nature of the different trees, how they could harness them, how they could take care of them, how could they could propagate them. Because we realized most of the people uh, didn't know uh, the benefit of certain trees. Hence, what you saw earlier on in, in regards to people going for more of royal palms. We, we do believe royal palms, their benefits as far, they, are, they have limited benefit. Talk of carbon. If you're going to, of course, the, uh, the trees that are very important for carbon sequestration, palm trees are not one of them. They are considered grasses. And so we are trying to, as much as possible, to educate our people that you do, we do not need palms. We need trees like mahogany, uh, Movule, Movule, I'm talking of Melissa Sexa, Mahogan, I'm talking of Kaya and Fofeka. So, those long lasting trees that hold, that are woody, that hold enough carbon. And so, allow me to take you to that platform, how it looks like. Uh, it's loading. Just give me a bit. So, that's our. Kampala tree, if you go onto the Kesia website, you'll find the Kampala tree, tree and palms directory. In it, you can just select, you can just, uh, you can take, you can type in a tree species you're looking for. You can even type in a common name. You can even type in a description and, you, and search by it, or the tree use, and search by it. So it's, we have categorized it uh, in a number of ways, medicinal trees, agroforest, edible trees, agroforestry, um, ornamental, so yes, so our people are able to learn from that platform all those uh, about all those trees. So uh, it also helped us to, we realize that people uh, tend to go into cutting trees indiscriminately and realize that we cannot allow that to go on. Uh, so we say uh, to, Develop an a revolution methodology for the soil of Kampala. This one, uh, this one of the things we really, uh, we put in in our marriage, in our ordinance, whereby if you damage a tree without the consent of the city authority, you are liable for for express penalties. Uh, it's in within our uh, the green transfer ordinance that we are proposing to the council, and so we developed and from it we. From the 500, from the from the 53,268 trees, averagely one for uh, each tree in Kampala costs uh, uh, is estimated to have an average value of 1.3 million Uganda shillings. And so we also went ahead and and uh, did a carbon uh, developed our carbon sequestration methodology, whereby we found out that it's estimated that 0 0.0012 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent is our annual sequestration for our trees, for, for our trees within the city. And also the, the, the audit also helped us to develop the, an urban management app. So this urban, urban, urban forest management app, yeah, it's a georeference tool that, that uh, displays, if you go on onto the Google map, uh, you can pinpoint where this tree is located. It has been embedded into with our GI system, uh, the roads, the properties, so we can easily monitor uh, all these trees. And if a tree has been removed, we then update it. So it's a, it's a tool that we have developed uh, to enable us manage our trees much better. And so people cannot be Overlooked, under uh, uh, overlooked, as in, in line with managing the urban forest. So the areas before we realized that we couldn't go. Let's say sensitive private properties, and so we developed an online public survey, uh, uh, survey whereby the public could help us uh, could send this information about tree, uh, the data about the trees. Remember, we are we're surveying a complete, doing a complete survey. So sensitive areas we asked the residents 
we of course give them guidance on how to get capture this information, send us back onto our server, we then update our server. But that information is treated differently from the information being picked by the experts. So we first look at that information before we integrate with the expert uh, with the information picked by the urban foresters. So um, they then help us send that information. And in addition to that, uh, that people cannot, this, uh, the community cannot be uh, underlooked as in line with managing our trees. We dropped uh, a mobile application. We we'll call it the eCity. The eCity uh, city. City stands for, city is one of, uh, the abbreviation of city uh, stands for our core values. The core values we talk about uh, client care, uh, integrity, teamwork, innovativeness, and excellence. That's why you, uh, that app is called the eCity tree. So it's, the, it's an app, app that uh, citizens or the community people can report dangerous trees or trees that need action, maybe pruning, Maybe there's a developer who is cutting down trees. So this, they report to us these incidences and we go uh, money, uh, move in, in time. So they can reach us through, they can call us, they can email us. The website there, they can also uh, visit our website uh, to understand, to get to understand the, tree direct, the trees through in the tree directory. They can also call us on our platforms. Allow me go to the plan. Yes, one of the reasons why we went ahead and did first a tree inventory was to inform us in developing an urban forest management plan. So the urban forest management plan uh, is a document that would, uh, is a strategic document. It's a 20 year strategic document that's going to help us to guide on what to do, when to do it, and how, and how to do it. The principles, uh, the standards are embedded in that. Uh, we it's, it's with a vision of that by 2039, Kampala will be uh, the Kampala urban forest will be abundant, diverse, healthy, self reliant and cared for by with all by all citizens, as it contributes to the safety of the community uh, of the community, and creation of a green, a lush green, attractive and livable city across the region. So we, uh, as a city, we want to be a benchmark city within the region, uh, whereby. When someone walks into Kampala, would then start to ask these uh, questions. How do these people do it? How, how, what are they doing right? Yes, so that's the plan. However, this, uh, as Kampala, we're also helping other cities within Uganda, uh, because in, during the project, we, the project was supposed to help uh, cities like Entebbe and Kasese to develop uh, something of the kind. But that is still in development in the development phase, uh, as Kampala is still uh, as Kampala is setting off. As we as we continue, we will, of course, bring uh, continue training the cities, the different cities within within, within Uganda. Uh, now, of currently, we have been added with more cities. There's Mbale, there's Mbarara, there's Aroa. So all those cities will give them um, guidance on how to do it, based on our experience. If we talk of the Kampala Urban Forest Mining Plan, we need uh, the understanding. Uh, the understanding of that is that we first, uh, what is the urban forest comprised? What is the status of of late? It's located, of course, within um, those coordinates. Um, the urban forest is look uh, at an average of one thousand one hundred twenty millimeters. Of course, we experience tropical climate and receive a double maximum. With, uh, with, the, with the rainfall precipitation of between 1,200 to 2,000 millimeters, that's a lot of rainfall. So you realize how uh, the trees grow throughout the, uh, the yeah. Of course, our vegetation is comprised of grasses and shrubs. And due to our study, we, uh, we have realized we have over 300 species within the city. Uh, if you look at the wildlife within, you have, of course, diverse birds. Uh, being being it uh, being being Kampala being found within the tropics, of course the diversity is so high, and so it has a number of diverse bird species. Of course the bees, the lizards, especially those that live in the because of the wetlands. Uh, we we as Kampala we are found within the hills. So the hills we first started with the seven hills, but right now the city has expanded 
to cover more hills. And within the valleys, you have the wetlands. So that's where you find most of the frogs and the lizards. Um, of course, the, the land area is 1,076 of the 189 square kilometers. And, on, and of that, of the 189, we have 13 square kilometers of water. We are about, we are, Lake Victoria is bordering us. Uh, the land, uh, so our tree spread is, pro, is approximately 26.4 square kilometers with, uh, with an average canopy cover, with a canopy cover, sorry, it's not average, but a canopy cover. Uh, pardon me on the, uh, the word average. It's, we have a canopy cover of 15%. If we talk about canopy cover, we're looking at uh, the trees vis-a-vis -vis the green infrastructure. So if you look at the green infrastructure, it's the other, other percentage then the hour canopy covers only 15%. The tree density, of course, as earlier mentioned, of 13 trees per acre. Yes, speaking of diversity of the urban forest, um, as per the Simpson index, realize we, we, the city is very diverse. Of course, the index ranges between, well, the index we use whereby it ranges between zero to one, whereby with a decrease, uh, diversity decreases with an increase index. So that's why you see that figure of 0 0.0056, you know. Uh, yes. So what are the, uh, our, as regards to the urban forest, the management operations? Of course, the urban forest is managed by the landscape unit, is the unit that is mandated to manage the green, the beautification, the green, the grasses and the like, the trees. So it's the landscape unit, of course, is under the direct of physical planning. That's why you're seeing DPP there. All trees within public spaces. And the operations we do is tree propagation. We have a functioning tree nursery that serves the entire, that serves our planting. We have, we, because we have an annual planting of 8,000 trees, that's our annual target per year. Um, of course, we do pitting, planting, whereby we have enough operations there. Gap filling where trees are dead because we do survey assessment. We do maintenance, pruning, trimming, climber cutting, pest and disease management. Removal where the tree is a danger is a dangerous tree, whereby we cannot, even though we do any remedies, we cannot avert the, lake, uh, the, the likelihood of it dying or causing harm to the neighboring community. So it's our mandate to remove it. Uh, of course, before we remove it, we do first a tree assessment to, uh, to diagonize it. The disease can it be still be maintained and certain remedies put in place so that to regain the health back? Uh, of course, then also do the mapping. Like now that we did the audit, uh, the, uh, the audit that did not stop there. It has, it's now it's our continuous process to map all the trees, even those ones that have just been planted by the community. We map them and it forms our database so that we were, easy, we're able to monitor all the trees within within the city. Survey assessment, data management. So um, the tools, equipment, and installation we have, as I've mentioned, we have a functional tree nursery uh, that is in charge of propagating a lot of all our trees and also flowers that we plant within the city. Uh, we do not buy, we only buy, we only procure trees where whereby our nursery cannot provide it. And so we're looking to the future whereby our nursery also, also starts donating out. Uh, though also currently we do tree donation, but at a lower scale, since we still have to first satisfy the city tree needs. So the surplus, we donate it to the, uh, the schools, though still we are in charge of planting also within the schools, but we donate to them. Uh, so, so we also do community sensitization. As we realize, 70% of Kampala land is, within a private, is privately owned. So uh, we have embarked on tagging our trees, as a form of sensitization tool. This tag you'll realize you, it has a message. Uh, it has a, a button at uh, a, 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 the bottom of the tree. And also the message whereby it's uh, rallying people as to why that tree should be protected. So we are, ta uh, we are tagging, it's, it's just, uh, it has just started, but we hope to tag all our trees in the near future. So, uh, one of, so as we're developing our management plan, um, of course, we had case studies, and these this case studies, where well, we looked at these case studies, because they have adopted policies and programs that help them meet their own forestry goal, urban forestry goal. Talk of Melbourne. Melbourne, of course, all know what uh, Melbourne has a management plan. 
And so in addition to that, they have gone ahead and developed apps whereby the community report, uh, report any tree management needs. Or oh, let me say trees that need attention. Seattle, they have designated their district forestry elements within key departments. So yeah, we looked at them as one of the benchmark cities. Coritiba, Coritiba is a city in Brazil. Uh, it has embraced uh, preser preservation of remnant trees in the city. Realize that Kampala has a problem. As from our audit, we realize that we have less old trees. Why? Uh, so we looked at uh, so Coritiba. We looked at Coritiba to what? What how are they doing it to preserve their remnant trees? Those, those old old trees. They have also pioneered carbon sequestration quantification. In fact, that we as Kampala want like to understand our carbon stock and our annual carbon sequestration potential. So Coritiba was one of the cities that we looked into. Uh, how they're doing it best. Jobak, of course, Jobak is in Africa. Yes, Jobak in Africa, they do not have a management plan, but later on in my slide, uh, when I'm looking to the prospect of urban forestry in East Africa, I'll talk about some new research. Jobak as in South, South Africa as, as a nation, uh, their cities, they have done a number of research. And so, so this research has informed them on different NGOs, society organizations, to engage in managing their trees, though they do not have a functioning urban forest remaining plan. And also I'm happy to say that uh, from the research that we did uh, from information and literature review, realize that Kampala in Africa, Kampala is the first city to develop an urban forest management plan. And so, yeah, uh, we realize most of the cities within, Afri uh, within Africa, they are more of, they have done research documented, but did not have a clear guide on how to manage the urban forestry. So looking at the management plan that we have developed, the 20 year management plan that um, runs from 2020, from 2020 to 2039, uh, from 2019 to, 2019 to 2039, uh, one of the goals is to enhance and maintain the tree canopy cover and also conserve and protect. Realize as you, as I early on, my, mentioned to you guys, we have 13 protected species. We need to increase their abundance and their number. This would be in line with the, the convention biological, uh, by uh, the CBD convention, the real summit, the real Earth summit whereby city, uh, countries were, were asked to prioritize conservation biolog uh, biological diversity. And so those protected tree species, we're looking forward to, en to enhancing their number, increasing them. And so the, uh, the ordinance also protects them. Uh, the urban, for, urban green forest ordinance that I've mentioned earlier on protects them. We have embedded all those species there, whereby someone to remove that species should uh, uh, justify beyond reasonable doubt where that tree should go. And if it's supposed to go, it has a very high cost to the person, the developer that's going to develop. So we are taking it very seriously for our protected species, uh, for the tree, protected tree species, because we are looking at it as it was attraction as well, because they are not uh, someone to drive to Budongo Forest to see the Budongo Mahogany. Why doesn't he just come to the city and get to understand it, how it grows, how, and their management uh, um, perspective. And so under these goals, we have objectives, of course, to increase tree density of the urban forest. We realize we have only 13, we have only 13 trees per acre. Per, per acre, but our our goal, our we look that in the next in the next five years we keep on increasing the tree density. By the year twenty thirty nine, we like to see that we have twenty trees per acre in the long uh, in the yeah twenty trees per acre. That's our ambitious goal. We hope to achieve it uh, with the backing from the institution and also the government, and also. Uh, the other objective that we have is to develop an urban forest management framework. Of course, talking about the urban forest management framework, we are, uh, we are talking of the valuation methodology. Yes, we have not yet gazetted it, it's still in draft, but once it's gazetted, uh, it will become part of the framework. The carbon um, uh, estimation methodology, it will, uh, it will be part of it, whereby it will be a reference enrichment for even cities within Uganda. Um, we're talking about the management standards, pruning, weeding, 
the do's and the don'ts, irrigation. So uh, we are looking forward to ensuring that those, all, those, all those frameworks are put in place to better guide, um, in the, uh, better guide the city in the management of the urban forest. The other objective that we're looking at is increase diversity of native tree species. Yes, real, as you've seen earlier on, we have only 20% native tree species. It's alarming if we are to curb anything to do with hunger, if we are to curb something to do with biodiversity loss, if we are to curb something to do with um, the genes, to curb genetic loss. Because if we end up replacing our uh, urban forest with exotic tree species, then we are going to lose out on cultural values. As you know, the number of benefits trees have to culture, uh, so there are some tree species within Uganda that are linked to the culture institutions. Uh, let's talk about uh, Ere Smolokana, that's the Kabaka and Jagala. It's, it's very prominent in the Buganda kingdom. It's one of our uh, uh, tribes that, uh, many tribes that we have in Uganda. And so if we have a, a stretch actually that was uh, a road that was named after the tree, um, the Ficus natalensis, it's a, a, it's a species that is mostly used for bark cloth making. So we are looking at harnessing the native tree species because we, really, we know that if we harness the native tree species, then there are ripple, there's the ripple effect that will also go into the biodiversity conservation. So yeah, uh, we, are, we have put that onto our agenda highly. And also our nursery has prioritized, our tree seedling nursery has prioritized propagation of native tree species vis-a-vis -vis exotic tree species. So that is how much, how far we have gone to ensure that we increase the, uh, the native tree, tree species within the city. Increase awareness of the urban forest manage, uh, of the management of the urban forest. Yes, during our, during the audit and the audit which is still going on, people, uh, there's, uh, information gap within our people and um, whereby we need to uh, continuously educate them about these benefits. Why they shouldn't plant this? If they plant this tree species, what are the enormous benefits that come with it? If they plant this tree species, what will they be missing out? If they, uh, and also help to educate them on which tree species to plant. Because you'll find that uh, someone plants a tree and he doesn't know that this tree is going to grow and reach the power line. All this tree within uh, years to come is going to become a danger to the, the infrastructure. And so we, much as we have gone ahead to educate them, and yeah. So going to my last slide, I'll look at the prospect of urban forestry in East Africa. Urban forest being, of course, a branch of agriculture, one of the branches of agriculture. Uh, urban forestry is shaped by the context within which it's embedded and under which it operates. Uh, in East Africa, of course, it has been researched, but um, less has been put in action. In this, you'll find that they have researched, but all this research is gathering dust, in, dust on the certain shelf. However, Kampala as a city, of course, has gone to try to, to break that by putting it into action, making it, uh, making it an everyday thing within the cities. Uh, publications have, also, of, of course, cons consists, consistently grown uh, from 2006 to 2013. Uh, to 2013, publications have increased, and as you see uh, in the graph there, you realize we have certain, we have certain um, uh, countries, cities within those countries like Kenya, Rwanda, Burundi. There is research, but down the groundwork, there's still lacking. So there's a need for cities and uh, within the East African region to take up urban forestry as a main, main thing to ensure sustainable development. In, uh, uh, in terms of sustainable cities, in terms of um, climate action, because if we tackle climate, uh, if we grow, if we ensure that we preserve trees and grow trees in the cities, we're going to reduce on uh, abundant island effect. We're going to improve, reduce on flooding. Of course, as Kampala, we have that problem. So we, we're trying to reduce that by in, uh, increasing on the dampening of the hard surfaces. And so, so that people enjoy moving and in, moving around the city. 
could uh, of course there's a number of planting that I've done, but all of this is fragmented. And so there's a need for proactive for city uh, proactively cities to take up this. Of course, as we come follow, we aspire to pioneer and replicate this within our cities within the country. We shall, of course, as of the project, uh, the project, the e project, uh, we of course went into Entebbe and Kasese. And so they're preparing the action, the climate action plans, and they have embedded in a tree audit. So that is also informs on their municipality urban forestry management. So we aspire as a city within Kajuganda to help our cities and also the region to take up urban forestry actively to ensure that we create sustainable cities, uh, uh, tackle climate change, and also uh, conserve life on land and water. Thank you very much for a better city. Thank you very much, Pade. That was brilliant. That is such inspirational work going on there. I know we've talked about it before and it's it's really, really great. And I think the world has an awful lot to learn from the work that you and your colleagues are doing. So it's great. Lots of questions, lots of chat. It's all very exciting. Um, yes, I was going to say a couple of bits about it, but I'm not going to. It's all flying by so far. So please keep your questions coming in. Um, we are going to come back to Paddy at the end, but first of all, we're very lucky to be joined by Kathy. Uh, Paddy, if you want to stop sharing your screen, if you could, and Thank then you. Kathy can start sharing her screen, and then we're off again. Brilliant stuff. All right. I hope everybody can see that and that I can. Okay, Sophie, you're going to be advancing for it. All right. I'm going to talk a little bit faster than Paddy, but I am so proud of Paddy. I'm so proud of Isaac. I'm so proud of the whole Kampala team. I lived there for 25 years and. Um, it's absolutely brilliant. They're setting the, the standard and the pace for all of East Africa. And I'm really happy that we've got Brigitte from Kigali. We've got Girama from Ethiopia. And my last slide is a suggestion that we form an East African group where we can all um, get together and talk about how we're managing our cities. So this view that you're seeing here, I'm Kathy Watson. Uh, I work at World Agroforestry and C4, which focuses on tropical trees. I live in Nairobi now. Um, this is about how urban, tree, how a, a highway, how the road reserves offered us a huge opportunity to plant. Uh, and this is, um, you can see a, a lot of bio, biomass right here where there was mud just um, a year ago. Next slide, please, Sophie. Okay, so this is what um, the highway was like. It's, it's five kilometers and it cuts from one big road to another big road in Nairobi. Um, uh, it was built by Chinese uh, contractor. Um, and we feel that with the climate crisis and biodiversity, you know, Pade has pretty much said it all. Every space is an opportunity to capture carbon, create habitat for biodiversity. We have big flood problem in Nairobi. The groundwater is not filling back up uh, because there's a lot of people extracting it. Um, so we want to have more groundwater infiltrating. We have terrible floods. And we also have the, the urban heat island. So when we, I drove up and down this road, I thought we've got to do something about it. Uh, next slide. So we actually met with the highway authority. This is more like a story, what I'm going to give you. We went to see them um, and other groups along the highway were also approaching them. But I, I found out how to find them. And I went to talk to them with two colleagues, one from the UN Environment Program and one from my own organization, uh, a Kenyan professor of botany. And there was a slight not meeting of minds when we went to see the highway team, although they, this is the environmental group of it. They were really, really friendly. And as you can see, we're all having a good time. But they had a very, uh, I don't, you would all know better, but they had this idea of beautification and landscaping, right? And they showed us some sort of designs that they had, had commissioned. And we were really pitching this concept of a green corridor. Uh, for them, price of the tree was very important. So exotics tend to have small seeds uh, and um, especially the ones that come from Australia, for example, and it's, it's much cheaper to grow them. So a favorite one is this Casarina, which is an Australian tree. Uh, it's an Australian sort of piney, pine type tree, conifer. And then this one called Thevetia peruviana, which is really only a shrub, but it's planted a lot on highways. All parts are actually toxic. Um, and so in this conversation, we tried to talk to them about native trees 
And I know Anne Altwater is there from Tanzania on the call. Hi, Anne. Um, you know, we were really starting off with a big commitment, just like Pade, that we really wanted indigenous species. And, you know, Kenya is the land of Wangari Mathai, who won the Nobel Prize um, several years ago for her work with the Green Belt Movement. So we made this case with them. Next slide. Yeah, and we got permission to plant, as did other groups. Um, so, th so this is the bypass, and it goes through kind of actually green, well-greened suburbs. It, it doesn't have a lot of poor communities around it. And this one on the with the roundabout is my portion, effectively, or the portion I grabbed because I live very close to it, and I saw it every day. And I decided I would tackle this bit, and nobody else was tackling it, and, and other groups had people working on it. Uh, you can see that there's a, a sort of a circle next to the roundabout. That's actually a very important wetland that must not be built upon. And then we also have some activism going on around that. Next slide, please. So this is what it was like in December 2019. And it was actually, we were heading into the dry season. I saw one of you asked about how does the rain work? Yeah, just like in Kampala, we have two rainy seasons and you've got to pay attention to that. And over the last year, we have lost grass and various things. We haven't lost trees, but we have lost grass to, um, to the sunshine, to the, to, the, to the dry season, right? So this is what it looked like. It was very, very, very dry. It was full of rubble um, and the rains were ending. And I, you know, one of the things we say at World Agroforestry is you have to uh, have community buy-in if you're gonna do any kind of restoration. And I didn't have that. I was just so keen to plant. So I approached a nursery that was about five kilometers away, four kilometers away. And they thought it was like a paying job, which of course I paid them for it, but they weren't really like, they were just like rushing through it. Um, and, but you know, they tried and we got, we did a bit of work, but they only worked for about a few days. Next slide. And then I went away and I came back and it was pretty, uh, most of the things had died. It was over the Christmas period. It was hot sunshine, very, very dry. And so we had a big reset in January and I contacted the tall gentleman in blue, who is a, a John Orwell, who is a distinguished forester who had just retired from managing Karura, which is the earth, big 1,000 1, hectare forest in Nairobi that was saved from Wangari Mathai and is now very safe to go in and has in this COVID period had like a tripling of people going there because green space is such a priority. And we, we went really slowly and we cleaned the soil and we mulched it and we got all ready and I wasn't rushing at this point. And I found a community nursery, just a couple of um, maybe 200 yards away. And we, I started to work with them and they have been an absolute dream team. So we offer them the minimum daily wage and they that may look like a lot, very little money for people in Europe. But most people in Nairobi, 60% um, of the population lives in informal settlements, which they, they themselves call slums. And they would be very fortunate to earn $2 a day, right? So $6.50 a day was a hugely um, attractive price for the ladies. And we didn't have any money fundraised. So in the beginning, uh, we paid for it ourselves, my husband and I, but we, we began to get uh, tremendous uh, support after that. Next slide. Um, so really the whole issue of rain was incredibly um, important. Uh, ecologically, we get, um, we have the two rainy seasons. We have less uh, rainfall than Kampala. Um, we're actually at about um, almost 6,000 feet here. It's we're high, um, so it can be cold, but it's still a tropical dry upland montane forest. So one of our big um, objectives was to try and get back that kind of trees onto the land. And it, it has a, you know, Kenya has something like 600 tree species, right? Um, as does Uganda a huge diversity around the equator. So we had a lot to choose from, and there's a much bigger potential palette that you can choose from than there is in a place like London. Um, next slide, please. So we started to plant. 
Um, we put little stones around them because we, we wanted people to be cleared the rubble. We put it along the sidewalk, as you can see there. We put little kind of dinky little circles of, of, of stones around the trees because we wanted to show people that we were actually doing it, that this was purposeful because we didn't want, want them to be cut or stepped on. Um, and, and we kept on putting mulch because, you know, we all know how important soil health is. And this was a, a, an area that had been, you know, turned up and down by bulldozers. And, and we thought that the soil was probably pretty dead. And we planted our first 28 trees on 21st of January. And this is the species here, which will probably won't make much sense to anybody who doesn't live in East Africa. But these are all indigenous and they're all typical of the forest. Um, none of them were really fruit trees um, uh, as such. Uh, we were worried about fruit trees. Some people said, do avocados. Obviously, they're from Latin America. Um, but um, we were worried because there are monkeys still in the neighborhood. We were worried about casualties of monkeys getting hit on the road. We were worried about kids falling, climbing the trees and falling out. So we actually stayed away from them. Next slide, please. So, okay, this is now May, right? So we in December, this is five months after the failed attempt to start. And you can see how the trees are coming up. And you can also see that we grassed it. This was in the middle of the rain. It was fantastic. We regrassed this area. There was a lot less erosion. And the grass is not done with seed. It's done vegetatively. So each tiny piece goes in. It actually costs us a lot more than the trees did because uh, it's extremely labor intensive. Um, so we're very, very happy about this. The wetland is just to the left of that road, if you can see it. Um, and people began making donations because they saw what we were actually doing. Next slide, please. So um, here we are. This is a bit later. I, I can't see the top of the thing. I think this is probably May or something, or maybe a little later, maybe something like September. But you can see the trees are really, really growing. We've removed the little dinky kind of, you know, funny garden circles around the trees because we wanted the water to flow in. Um, really nicely. And it was obviously clear that these were trees now. And um, it for us, it's very moving. Um, we have people sitting in the trees. Um, they're even taller now because this picture dates from a little while ago. Uh, we have people sitting in the shade. And, um, you know, recently, uh, actually last weekend, we had people come and take their wedding photographs standing on the grass because there's an acute lack of green space in Kampala, in um, Nairobi. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the roundabout really became our flagship area in a sense. So that's what it looked like. And this is what it looked like about, you know, two months ago. Uh, that's, this is where the wedding photographs are taken. I don't know how the bride got over. There's actually a, a ridge that, you know, a, a barrier there. Um, but we're really, really pleased with, with the progress we've made. And people stop and talk to us in their cars. Um, and um, the walkers stop and talk to us and thank you, us for what we're doing and they thank the team. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanna talk about tree equity. I don't know this, if this is a thing that you're talking about, but um, American Forests, which is the oldest um, um, conservation group in the United States has coined this term tree equity. And it's based on the idea that tree cover tracks with income. So rich areas have a lot of trees and poor areas have none uh, or, or almost none, right? And that's certainly the case in Kampala. And um, so we see this project, okay, it's gorilla planting, it's landscaping, it's regreening, it's creating a green corridor, it's building biodiversity, it's capturing carbon. But we also see it as a sort of social equity and social justice project where Pedestrians who come from poor, poor communities and are not able to afford to take, uh, um, you know, a small bus, uh, a matatu they're called, into town and walk it every day, um, actually benefit from some green. And there's a very, very nice document, if anybody um, wants to look it up, which is published by FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, and the World Health Organization of the UN on peri urban and peri-urban uh, forestry. And they make the point that very few public health interventions um, 
achieve as many multiple goals as bringing trees into a city because you have more physical activity, you have less heat, you have shade, there's all the social benefits of people being able to go outside, there's reduced crime. I'm sure you know all of that, but um, this is something that's very much on my mind as we're working. Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, we got an awful lot of species in. So many that in fact, I, I, I lose track of the number and I've also lose track of all the species, although I have tried to tr use a, um, a geo-reference thing. Um, you know, we don't have a big team working on this, um, but the, of course, in the beginning, I was wildly opposed to any non-indigenous species, right? But after a while, I thought there's an equity issue here, you know, affluent people have hibiscuses in their gardens, right? I'm going to plant some hibiscuses and people like it. They feel kind of pampered by it. They feel we're doing something very deliberate. That's a pink hibiscus right there. But the red flower is an indigenous um, Kenyan flower called Kleinia abyssinica. It's been much easy, easier to get indigenous trees than it has been to get indigenous flowers or grasses. Um, we have planted very, very large ficus um, species that are going to become very large fig trees. That's one at the bottom there. Um, and it's already at almost maybe 15 feet high. Um, and um, we also then finally we began to mow, which makes it look really smart. And we have actually started to see a lot of wildlings coming up as well. And there's a couple of indigenous species here that just seed like crazy. And so we're actually letting them come up. And we're not cutting down anything that we found there. There were one or two avocados and there were one or two wattles and we've just left them. Next slide, please. Oh, so this was great. We didn't anticipate this, but if you just go like this to the leaves of the trees, because they're, you know, you can look down into the trees because a lot of them are not, you know, not yet taller than five feet or whatever. And there are very, very many hyperoleus tree, uh, reed frogs, tree reed frogs. And there's, I think, three species there. And there's even been some quite rare ones. And when I post them on Facebook, various herpetologists and, and amphibian groups from East Africa say, well, where is that? So we, we take that as a biomarker of in ecological health and we're thrilled to see them come. Next slide, please. Yeah, and none of this could have been done without the team. Uh, the young ladies there at the top, um, minus the, the European gentleman there, they're um, mothers, young mothers, and you can see one of them carrying um, a plant on her head. All of this has been done with just physical labor. You know, I drive manure down there. I drive tree seedlings in my car. Um, we carry mulch down there in bags. But these ladies have actually shifted everything all up and down, right? Up and down this bypass. Um, uh, and I'm highly indebted to them. And they are actually the face of the bypass themselves. The lady who's uh, in with the black mask on, she's from Nairobi Museum, which is like the Smithsonian or something. They've got a lot of scientists there. She's a pollinator biologist, Dr. Um, Wanja. And she came to check, to sort of check me out and make sure that we were planting trees that are favorable to pollinators. And this is Ellie Koge, who's the restoration manager um, for Karura Forest, where they are replanting with fantastic indigenous species. And this is Mark Nicholson, the, the English gentleman there who runs um, a botanical garden in the highlands near Nairobi and has given me a whole bunch of species where I write the names down and I haven't crammed all the names. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so, you know, we have uh, cultivating people, people who are, who are agriculturalists, and then we have pastoralists in East Africa. And you can see from the red um, uh, shawl that this young man is wearing that um, he's, he's a Maasai, he's a Maasai person. And um, there's drought around the city and there's lack of um, pasture. And we have had these young men bring their herds onto the bypass. Uh, it's actually illegal, um, but of course, you know, what to do. And it's part of the complex social dynamics of it. And you can just see me here saying to them, please be careful, please don't trample the trees. And they're actually heading into the wetland, which is on the left there, where they 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 walk through the, the vegetation there. We did lose about 10 trees, um, but they were great. And we've actually fenced the trees, some of the more delicate trees now. And, um, and actually, to be honest, the, the trees we lost, they were the first planting. 
And I'm just as happy to put in some more interesting species that I've been able to get my hands on. And this is a complex social problem, social issue here of, of lack of pasture and poverty. Um, and uh, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so we had these very sheer slopes and I'd love your advice on it. I would love to be able to get geotextiles. There are none available despite all the coconut trees down at the Kenya coast. Choir could be a really good option and I've researched it from India. If we could lay it there and then plant through it, we do get tremendous um, erosion as you can see coming onto the bypass. So we did this kind of thing, we made it up. We used um, a lot of invasive species actually. We cut the, the stems and we sort of created a sort of a barrier and we're gonna try and plant behind it. Um, and we're also very aware of the fact that we have very, very hot, heavy rainfall in Nairobi and that the larger the, the larger the leaf, the more it catch, you know, breaks the uh, power and the velocity of the, of the fall of the raindrop. So this is a, um, one's a ficus there on the right and the other one is where Inviolata's hand is posed is a species called Cordia africana, which is very, very, uh, um, yeah, we'd like to terrace the slope. I can see no, we really can't terrace the slope. But we're we're gonna try and we're gonna try and do things to it. We're gonna try and get falling plants that go down it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, um, you guys know how to prune trees properly. Um, Nairobi City Council does not hire any uh, employ any foresters, unlike Kampala City Council. Um, this is a tree that has struggles. This is Cordia africana, a fantastic tree with very large leaves, but it has this issue of not establishing apical dominance. So it kind of goes in this direction and that direction. So we've been trying to prune it to get it go straight, um, but it flowers very quickly and uh, it's great for bee forage and for mulch, but it's, it's sort of one of our, our challenge trees, but we really like it a lot. Next slide, please. So, People are really, they really like what we've done and people stop and people email us and people have asked us to come elsewhere. This first one here where there's a billboard, you can see there's lots of roundabouts with absolutely nothing planted. And you know, it's you just wish you could get going on it. And we're we're looking at trying to get funding. And there is a kind of the city government um is um you know, there's there's a lot of things happening. There's a lot of tree cutting, as you can see at the bottom here, for flyovers, and there are a lot of demonstrations against that. But at the same time, you know, they they realize, especially during COVID, how incredibly important green space is. So there's sort of different things going on. Upper right hand here is eucalyptus, um, casuarina, um, and another exotic. That's unfortunately where you do see plant tree planting, like Paddy was saying. You have these trees. These are Australian trees. Very, very unfortunate. Um, and, and exotics are much less expensive to, to buy in town, but they're poor for biodiversity and soil and, and ecosystem services and disaster risk reduction. Um, next slide, please. So there's a tremendous need for arborists and capacity building and collaboration. Um, but you know, there's a huge desire and there's a lot of skills, right? People know how to plant, people know how to grow. Um, people, know, pe this is an agricultural society fundamentally. So there's a lot of knowledge about how to handle plants. And I really hope we can create an East African urban forest network. And I'm very grateful to John Parker for inviting me to talk on here. And I'm very proud of Pade and what the team has done in Uganda. And I hope we can all continue to learn from each other. Thank you very much. I almost spoke without unmuting myself then. That would have been a first. Thank you so much, Kathy. Uh, another inspirational project. Uh, and again, there's so much interest and so much uh, so much love for what you're doing there in the chat. So um, thank you, Kathy, and thank you, Paddy. We've got lots of questions, lots and lots and lots of questions to get through. Uh, and we're going to be sort of jumping around a little bit. Uh, one question I wanted to start with you, Paddy, is... Um, a few people jumped onto some of the statistics that you picked up on the, particularly the tree ages. Um, Jackie uh, identified uh, in the chat 40% of trees under 10 years. And Anthony was saying uh, your, your, your statistic of 94% of trees under 40 years. And that's prompted a couple of members of the audience to ask, 
sort of is that a is that that you've planted so many trees in the last few years that that's a sort of positive story or is it because you're losing an awful lot of mature trees thank you very much john and thank you for the to the audience for the question hello john yes and uh uh, uh, we have planted. Uh, actually, it has become it, it has become a deliberate effort and uh, a target for the city authority and Kampala in general to ensure, uh, that we plant every year where there's a target of trees are supposed to plant. So it has become a deliberate effort, whereby we have eight eight thousand trees target by year. That means if we have two seasons of rain, we have we have four thousand four thousand per season. So it has become a, a deliberate target. In addition, uh, you spoke about uh, the old trees. Yes, it's quite unfortunate that uh, we are losing these old trees. Uh, why we are losing these old trees, it, then there are a number of factors that are arising, but the biggest factor we found out is that the development. Kampala is one of the fast growing cities mm -hmm. in the world. And so infrastructure development is it's like Kampala has become a construction site every day. Mm -hmm. So uh, this and where they are construct, doing this construction works, it's where the old trees are located. Uh, it has also become as part of our um, policy. You cut a tree, you plant four. So where a developer cuts a tree, he has to plant four trees as replacement. That's why you see this number, small uh, young trees. Uh, and also infrastructure work. Uh, this, uh, recently, uh, we... We embark on plan on widening our roads due to uh, population growth. As I've showed you earlier on, there we have a daytime population of 4.5 million people. These are people who come outside Kampala to work, live, and go back. So our realize our our roads were narrow. So the widening of roads has also hugely uh, resulted into reduction on the old roads. Remember, these old roads were planted on the road verges way back in the 1960s. Some of them are 50 years old trees. And so at times where we do not have the ability to, to keep the tree around, we go ahead and say, okay, you cut, but at this cost. So we, uh, for such an old tree, a developer will say, this is, if, you're, if you're cutting this number of trees, you replace this number of trees. However, even when there's no space, we shall show you an alternative site to pull these trees. So you because they come out and say, you know, these are the site, the remaining space is small, I cannot plant all these trees, and you recommend these species. So we say, no, we have other spaces. Hence that young, uh, that graph, these are the old trees, yes. Thank you, Paddy. As always, it doesn't matter where our speakers are working and presenting from, the problems that they describe are always the same. And I can assure you, what you just described is the same as we face in the UK. Um, I'll just follow up on another question. Sorry, Paddy, I'll come with you in, in a second, Kathy. But related to that, um, Paul and Ian, and I think a couple of others, have asked if there's any legal frameworks uh, in Kampala for uh, preservation, tree preservation. And are any of those trees, are there mechanisms to protect those mature, big, special trees? Yes, we have legal frameworks. Thank you very much uh, uh, to Catherine, uh, to the uh, audience that has asked that question. Yes, we have legal frameworks. Uh, with, uh, the National Environment, Environment Management Act as amended 2019. Yeah, it's, it guides on conservation, in situ conservation, whereby trees are conserved within that area and are not taken somewhere else to be conserved. Uh, so, yeah, we have a legal framework. In addition to that, we have, of course, the National Forestry and Tree Planting Act. It's a national document. It, it also gives, it has also provisions that guides on the preservation of trees. Talking about biodiversity, yes, we have the Wildlife, the wildlife Act. There are certain trees uh, that are interest to our wildlife authorities, the Uganda Wildlife Authority. Well, these trees were birds' nest uh, because we realize most of our, uh, you know, people who have uh, had the privilege to visit Kampala, you know, the marabusto, the bird with the long neck. Uh, there are quite very many in Kampala. And so they nest. And uh, 
Yes, uh, I'll just give you a small bit of a story. We have uh, Makai University as a, an institution has a direct policy within the city that the, the institution do not touch any tree that is within the university. So if a tree dies, they allow it to rot and degenerate back into the, they do not take it away. They leave the carbon to go back into the soil naturally. Sorry, I do not, I have not given you, I have not had the opportunity to show you the one of the photos. And so it's a debate policy. And that is where most of the birds do breed. Most of the birds within the city do breed because of that policy. After when we audited, we realized it had the biggest number of tree stock and, by, and diversity. So yeah, we have legal framework. Of course, um, they are not biting. They are not biting. And as a, as a city authority, that's the reason why we have come up with a green infrastructure ordinance to plug the loopholes so that our, mm -hmm. our agenda is not compromised by the loopholes within the national legal frameworks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pade. Thank you very much. Um, Kathy, I'll, I'll put the same question on to you, I suppose. In Nairobi, what's the sort of tree protection legislation? It seems to be very weak, and they've only they're doing a draft, new draft forestry act at the moment, and we commented on it, and I was really happy to see that they had an urban tree section, which said all the you know said all the right things, you know, schoolyards, um, road verges, public institutions, green spaces wherever possible. Um, I think um, they haven't quite worked out how to address it very well yet. That, and um, it's something that, that still needs to be done. And, and you know, Nairobi's um, a, a sort of a bigger city than, Nairobi, than Kampala, but it's also had tremendous growth. Uh, you know, green suburbs are now having very big skyscrapers going up in them. So there's a lot of loss all the time. But we've had a few new green spaces created. Uh, there was a new park that was created or an old park that was retrieved. And that, I just want to say something about that because um, forests can become dense uh, for um, people who with poor, bad intentions, you know, muggers and, um, you know, Karora Forest used to have bodies dumped there and, and gangs used to frequent it. So one of my priorities when I was sort of doing the road and, and, and still doing the road is not to create places where people are going to be out of sight. I try to keep it a bit open because we don't, you know, we want to, we have the kind of security issue in mind for people that, that we want it to be a safe place for people to walk. Thank you, Kathy. And of course, they always say that there's this awareness that unmaintained green spaces mm. can make things a bit perception yeah. of danger. But of course, yeah. well-maintained yeah. green spaces exactly. can reduce uh, instances of certain kinds yeah. of crime as well. So I suppose yeah. it's getting that message out there too. Yeah. Um, okay, let's go to a question for Kathy now. Um, question from uh, Mohammed in uh, Algeria, I believe. Hi, mm. Mohammed. Thank you for joining hey. us. Um, uh, Mohammed's asking for your choice of species to plant. Have you limited your choices to ornamental species only, or are you looking at big canopy stuff? A lot of what you've shown was sort of shrubby or quite small. Okay, that's probably because they are small, they're still young. But we did, you know, we were trying to do pretty much the biggest tree for the biggest space. So if we had a big space, you would try and plant something like a ficus, a fig tree, um, which we know has pretty colossal roots, is going to really reach, um, uh, is going to really spread. They're pretty much all indigenous. I did uh, plant one or two bainias, um, which are not Kenyan, but they have a nice white flower. And I've seen monkeys eating the leaves. The leaves are actually vegetables for some uh, populations in India. Um, so I sort of took, gave an exception to that. But basically, I would say like 95% um, or 98% of all the trees we planted are trees that are from this area of East Africa. Brilliant, thank you. Um, one question, I'll put this to Pade first, then I'll ask you, Kathy, as well afterwards. A couple of people have asked, uh, Ido's asked the question, how do you stop people chopping down trees to make fires to cook on? Uh, or are you growing trees that can be harvested for firewood? And the same question has been asked uh, by Phil. Is there any pressure in, in both of your countries uh, on, on, is there any pressure on trees from people who are looking to harvest wood for cooking? And, and is that a problem that you manage out? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Philip and uh, the, uh, the viewers. Yes, 
as Kampala, uh, Uganda in general, we have a problem of uh, chopping of wood for, for cooking, especially uh, charcoal burning. It's unfortunate that uh, nation, nationwide, uh, we keep on losing trees to charcoal burners, uh, uh, and that has been one of the biggest cause of forest loss within Uganda. And uh, of recently, yes, of recently we just reversed that as a country uh, because uh, we just reversed back. We now have twelve percent forest recover. It had shrunk. It had shrunk to 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 nine percent. But we are, we are we are happy that we are getting back. We we have now increased it back to twelve percent. And given the fact that we have um, a pending a pending campaign whereby we we. We want to plant 40 million trees in one day. Uh, it's a national plan by the Ministry of Water and Environment. It's they are preparing that. So these are one of the one, one of the campaigns we are putting in place to reverse, to keep on reversing the the, the shrinking uh, forest cover. Coming back to Kampala, yes, Kampala. Uh, we the of course the the city still predominantly use charcoal for cooking. Mm -hmm. And that you will see it uh, being uh, uh, having an, if, an impact with the forest recovery. However, it, uh, people are t uh, trying now to change. They are now trying to look at gas, gas, uh, gas petroleum, liquid petroleum gas. And I think uh, with the campaign, our Ministry of uh, Energy is undertaking, whereby they're creating awareness to uh, tell people that they should uh, choose alternative to gas as opposed to, to ch ch charcoal. And so, yeah, we hope that within the near future, that campaign will yield effect as people change from charcoal to gas. Uh, but in, uh, cutting trees is not uh, in Kampala has not been measured for cooking, but measured for development, to give space for development. Mm -hmm. And so whatever legal origins we're trying to put in, whatever guiding policies we're trying to put in, is to guide on development. Uh, we have a, a building control act and regulations. That's uh, still, now right now someone cannot uh, send a plan to those state authority to approve without you have without giving the store authority your green your grading strategy, your landscape design. It's also mentioned in our green infrastructure ordinance, whereby if someone sub submit a plan for approval, it's supposed to show us a, a landscaping plan. Where are you going to plant the trees? Where are you going to plant the grass? So where we're trying to reduce on full plot development to limiting it to a certain percentage. Of course, there we have drawn plans within the precincts, detailed road plans, but uh, we there are only four places we have done that. We have more 21 to go. Uh, so there's still a lot of work to be done. Thank you very much, Paddy. Interesting. Kathy, have you got similar yeah. experiences? Yeah, no, I just wanted to, I think for people who don't um, know the situation, you know, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa is cooking and living and lighting and warming things almost entirely on wood fuel. So the figures are sort of 85% of cook, are cooking on, on wood fuel, 95%. It's always in that range for almost every single country. And it's, it is draining wood to the cities uh, from the rural areas. Um, and uh, it's a very big story and people do need to cook. So, so in my organization, we don't think you should ban charcoal. We think you need to make it sustainable. Um, there's, there's a whole lot of stuff around that. I don't think that people are going to cut our trees, you know, for um, cooking. But what I do think, there's a lot of wood collection in the areas around because you can see where I am. There's still some fields and stuff. It's sort of the outskirts of Nairobi. And almost every day you see women carrying, they don't carry in a lot of Africa, they carry wood on top of their heads. In this part of Kenya, they carry it on their backs. And it often is older women who do that. It's quite a dramatic sight. And we've done studies of that and something that the average load is about 50 kilos, which is what about what I weigh. It's a lot of weight. Um, but we do think that we're going to generate prunings and we very and we've even trimmed that tree which has the problem with apical dominance and we just leave the stuff on the ground it all gets taken away right so wood is is something with a lot of value because people really do need to cook and i think a very interesting study would be has there been more wood collection during this COVID period where people don't have any money coming in because there's no work in town? And I, I've seen children collecting wood, which is something I don't normally see because, you know, they're usually in school. Um, but very good question, Ido. Yeah, very relevant. 
Thank you, Cathy. It's one of those interesting things, isn't it, when you're trying to persuade people of the value of retaining trees, mm, mm. if cutting down a tree means that you can actually use fuel to heat your home or to cook on or whatever, then that's kind of kind of a hard argument sometimes to say you shouldn't do that, I guess. Um, right, well, another question, we'll go straight to Cathy. A question from uh, Naomi. Hi, Naomi. Um, Naomi saying a, a big concern regarding species selection is the ability to tolerate pollution. Uh, and of course, as these are forest trees we're talking about, they're being asked to exist outside of their associated community. Uh, Naomi's wondering if there's any research uh, that you've, you've done or that you're aware of on these particular trees that you're planting, which determine their ability to accommodate urban conditions. Um, yeah, luckily we're not in downtown Nairobi and there there is a very big air pollution problem in both Nairobi and in Kampala, which is in Kampala. I know it's related to people cooking on wood fuel. It's related to um, old vehicles. Most vehicles are old. There's a lot of diesel. So actually the parts per million are, are terrible and they're mostly um, way over the limit. Um, it, uh, I'm a little bit on the outskirts of Nairobi. There's a lot of green here. It's not quite so bad as downtown. I think downtown, would, that would be an issue. There's only one tree where we've seen that the leaves have, don't look very happy, and that's Prunus africana, which is a very important tree, which has actually got a component in it that's important, exported for prostate cancer treatment. I haven't looked into it hugely, but it's, it's something that's been very much identified. But I, I hope that we're both curbing um, the pollution a little bit with these trees, and we will more so in the future, and that they're going to be able to tolerate it. Thanks, Naomi. Good question. Thanks, Kathy. Um, right, question for, uh, well, actually, Peter's asked this question for Paddy and Kathy, but we'll go to Paddy first. Uh, Peter's asking, what would you comment about the perception of the general population to trees? Do you think that, obviously it's a very broad question, but generally the people you speak to, the residents and the citizens you deal with, is their perception of trees positive or do they see them as a problem in Kampala? Yes, thank you very much, Peter, for that question. Yes, uh, I will categorize my the, my, the, my, the population of Kampala into two categories. So, so that I answer the perception uh, question very well. We have in Kampala, we have two kind of uh, two, uh, two, two populations. We have the inform uh, the land and the unland, the literate and the illiterate. Now you you'll find that in Kampala, the perception of the literate, um, most of them appreciate the importance of trees and why we should plant them, and they will support you. However, the illiterates are also a problem when it comes to, 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 tree, to trees, uh, to tree planting. Not, I, they will look at a tree and for them, they're looking at money. Some of them, uh, some illiterate. However, if you go to the informal people, uh, the informal people, you will realize that their perception to trees they would like, they like, they know the advantages of trees within their own local understanding. And so they, you'll, you, the, the things you'll normally hear from them, give me fruit trees. No, 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 this one doesn't, this one don't have the benefits. No, 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 give me, this one has the medicine. They even go ahead and explain to you that, you see this tree, give me medicine. I normally cut it for cough. Like, let's give an example of um, uh, calistenum, bottle brush. It's an exotic, unfortunately, but it cures cough. So you'll find people down in the community say, no, 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 no. That tree, I personally protect it because whenever my kids get sick, I pick the leaves and I cook. Uh, but the rich, some, the, some rich, they look, uh, when they're looking at trees, they're looking at aesthetics. They're looking at beauty. Actually, when you go to the rich neighborhoods, you'll find we have more palms, mm. palm trees, grass. I'll use the word grass because uh, fowl, uh, fowl describes as grass uh, uh, for palms and bamboo. Their carbon sequestration percentage is mm. not that good. So you'll find the, uh, most of the leaves are looking at aesthetics vis-a-vis -vis the broader importance of. Yes, there was a question regarding um, some trees be, uh, being I, sorry, I picked it within the, uh, the chat room here. Uh, one person was asking something to do with uh, these uh, exotic trees a problem. Yes, some of them are invasive. Like with the palms, if a palm is growing, 
there's no other, nothing else will grow under it. You know, and that's a very big problem. So uh, as a city, we are looking at um, one, replacing them, where there's a mm -hmm. palm, where we, we do gap, we, we do gap planting in, in, in between the palms. Two, discourage the planting of palms because in the ordinance, it's for you before you plant a tree within the city's boundaries. We are suggesting that you submit which tree you're going to plant. You get like permission so that will guide you. So that trees we just we are, we are just going to make it deliberate. Say no. If someone submits is going to plant palms, we do not entertain it. We guide you on something else. So yeah, thank you very much for that. That was a wonderful question. Thank you, Pado. Um, Kathy, have you got any thoughts there at all? Um, you know, mostly we talk to the people who are walking. And if they're not like jogger type people who are like middle class people who are running or something and then they're in their running clothes, they're people who are going to and from work and they stop and they say, you're doing a very good job. Um, and actually they used to, I used to say that there was like three things they used to say. They used to say, thank you, you're doing a very good job. And then the next thing they would say is, is do you have a job for me? Because, you know, people don't have jobs. And now since COVID started, people have started saying, I'm hungry, which is very heartrending to me. So actually I've been keeping sort of bags of maize flour in my car because I can't obviously give them all jobs. You know, it's obviously not possible. And um, uh, so I say, I'm, I'm really sorry, we don't have jobs, but I, I can give you this. And, and um, but uh, yeah, so I think, they, I think they really appreciate what we're doing. I think they appreciate the aesthetics of it a lot. I think they feel more valued. I think they really like to be able to sit down. And we've just had a study done of our refugee project in Northwest Uganda. And the number one reason that the refugees were planting our trees was for shade. And I think that's really underestimated. It's really, really, really hot for people sometimes. Um, and and they, people really need shade. Um, you know, it's, it's relentless, the sun. So that's another thing we need to think of. And of course we know shade is cooling as well. Thanks, Kathy. It's such a, I think it's a benefit of trees that we should be pushing more everywhere, really, mm, Shade, because so. it's such a tangible, easily understandable benefit. You can mm. talk about carbon capture and you can talk about all sorts of different things, but Shade, you know, it's cooler under a tree mm. than it is not under a tree. Um, right, Paddy, I've got a question for you that's from me. Nobody's written this down, but it's something I'm interested in. So I'm abusing my position as, as host. Um, uh, when I speak to a lot of uh, colleagues and friends working in different countries around the world in our Bora culture, uh, it's always interesting how people how people view those people who work with trees for a living. And in, in some countries, it's seen as a really good, noble cause to be working in. And sometimes people think, well, you're just a gardener. You know, why, why, are, you, why are you working with trees? And I was wondering, in, in Uganda, you know, when you say to your friends and family, I'm going to be an urban forester, is that something that was received positively or were they like, why do you want to do that? What's the perception? That's a very nice question. <laughs> and I'll give it from a personal point. Here I walk into a forestry class years back at university after doing, uh, completing high school, doing sciences, biology, chemistry, agriculture, geography. So the university gives me this course. I say, oh, forestry, oh, what's, this? what's nice here? So yeah, uh, uh, two weeks down the road, start looking at, oh, he's traveling, he's going to the forest to try to understand. So yeah, at first, from a, I did first not appreciate it from my perspective, but um, with knowledge and um, the environment and appreciating the resource itself, it became part of me that I need to push the agenda beyond, beyond me because I know back there, there are people, there are a thousand of people who are like me. So in sharing information and the benefits of trees became, has become part of what I live and do for every day. I pass on the street and I see someone manhandling a tree, I'll stop and say, hey, no, 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 no. You, what, we do it like this, we do it like this. Then the person like, oh, so what, what do you do exactly? I, I probably stand up and say, I'm a forester and I am practicing uh, urban forestry with Kampala Capital City Authority. We're in charge of helping you understand your trees 
and also uh, manage, co-manage with you, the community. So yes, uh, my people at home, they are so supportive. And um, yes, they did uh, guide me on every step and the sky is the limit. Great answer. Well, I think we're all very pleased that you chose forestry. Thank you, buddy. And you're welcome to come to the UK and tell people to stop breaking bits off trees as well, because we we have exactly the same issue here. <laughs> um, Kathy, uh, question from uh, Fai, who is in Cameroon, um, mm. asking how the creation of the green spaces that you're making help with biodiversity restoration. And have you got any particular tree species you use in the urban forest or green spaces specifically for biodiversity improvement? Yeah, thank you very much, Fai. In fact, I've just come back from uh, Ivory Coast and um, I know some of the West African trees. And in fact, we share some of them with you or, or in East Africa. Um, yeah, well, you know, these are these are trees that, as Pade said, um, provide food. Almost all of them have berries they ha or little fruits uh, or large fruits. Um, they obviously flower, so that's great for the pollinators, for the sunbirds. We don't have hummingbirds in Africa, we have sunbirds. Um, uh, you know, it's good for, we've seen praying mantises, so we're getting the insect life coming back. And eventually there's going to be perch points for birds. Um, and yeah, see, I think it's really important. And I just want to say something about this because Freetown at the moment in Sierra Leone is, is doing this incredible thing where they have this amazing mayor. Um, you can look her up. She's probably going to be the next president, but she's also one of Time Magazine's top 100 women. But she's turning Freetown into a tree town. And it's such a catchy thing, but they have had shocking landslides because the, the, it's a city on the edge of the ocean and then there's um, hillsides all around. And of course, people have had to build up the hillsides and they lost a thousand people in a very spectacular and horrible landslide. So she's trying to get the trees back. She's doing all the amazing things. Unfortunately, she's been advised by the Ministry of Agriculture rather than the, you know, the herbarium of Sierra Leone. And so she's planting pretty much entirely exotics and not very nice ones at that, but it's still very, very good effort. Um, um, so, yeah, I think, um, you know, all of these things that is going to bring back some biodiversity fee. And I think all of us need to get together as people who live in Africa and, and create a, a network in Ivory Coast in Abidjan. I was really happy to see they have one treed public square downtown. And at night it is a huge flock of or, or swarm or whatever you call them of bats come out of it and during the day the fruit bats just lie there and nobody seems to mind them and we know that bats are incredibly important um tree seed dispersers in west africa or all, all over the world so you know that's biodiversity on steroids when you see that colony of bats flying around downtown abidjan and it was great to see it and i filmed it and i can if you put your email in there i can send you a picture of it but you've probably also got bats um you know hanging from trees where you are yeah and that's really important and the biodiversity is super super important thanks kathy Paddy, you're, you're nodding as well biodiversity playing an important role in your work too yeah sure okay right we've only got time for a couple more. did you want to answer sorry sorry Paddy. did you want to say something more there mm, yes uh there's something I wanted to mention. Uh, Kathy mentioned something with bats. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Kampala, actually, I invite the world to visit Kampala because there are a lot of things to appreciate and peculiar things about Kampala. Actually, we have an area that bats used to hang. It's, it was named after bats. It's called Bat Valley. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, due to um, high development pressures, kind of shrinking day by day. But I invite the world to visit Kampala. There's a lot to appreciate about this city. Well, Pade, since you said that, we've already had some comments in the chat that I've been asked to organize a field trip to Kampala. <laughs> I'll, I'll do what I can, but may, maybe I should come first and, and check it all out. <laughs> Make sure it's okay for everyone, and then you can all join me there. Um, okay, we've just got time for a, a couple more quick questions, uh, and I'd like to uh, ask one from uh, Bridget, uh, Bridget, who I believe is in Rwanda. Hello, and um, thanks for joining us. Uh, the question is, 
where do you start promoting urban forestry? How do you start getting across the importance of urban forestry, especially during this time of climatic shock, storms, floods, poorly managed urbanization? How do you promote the importance of the urban forest as a solution to those things, uh, whether it's to politicians or to residents or, or other industries? Kathy, I'll ask you first, then, then we'll go to Pale. Well, I think if I'd if I hadn't just started to do it, I wouldn't have anything to show. So I think that if you have a small green space, like a, a corner of a road or something like that, plant something. Do this concept of gorilla planting, you know, like just go in there, start keeping it tidy. People will really like it. Um, and uh, I think let's just try and green every small space, no matter how small in cities. And people, you know, there was, you asked that question to Padi, and I remember when I got to Uganda in 1986, and, you know, we, they were coming out of the Amin period, and they're both, you know, these wars and everything like that. And I, you'd hear the chainsaw going, and I would go outside, and I'd say, please don't cut that tree. And people thought I was anti-development, like trees were just like something that was in the way, and we had to have buildings and so on and so forth. Now I think there's been a real shift. People realize it's really dusty, really hot, really polluted, the weather is changing and people are really yearning for green space and some shade. So I think there's a kind of trajectory you go through where, you know, trees don't seem important. You know, you're just a tree hugger, you know, you don't want us to develop. Um, but I think that's really changed now. So to the, to the person who asked that question, I'd say identify something, see if you can get permission to plant it, maybe just plant it anyway, because there may be nobody, uh, in the city government who's particularly interested in that place. There's, I mean, we did something fun, which is, you know, for about a dollar, you can buy a kilo of sunflower seeds here. And when the soil was bare, we just threw sunflower seeds along it. People were cutting them. People were posting about it on Facebook because it looked so glorious, this line of yellow flowers. So, you know, it doesn't have to be a massive tree. You could just plant a bit and just start off and do it. And then, you know, maybe dialogues will build up, letters to the editor, go to city hall and see if there's somebody in charge of trees. It can slowly build up. Thank you very much, Kathy. Uh, Pare, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, yes, uh, in regards to that question, the floods and the, the, the shocks that come with lack of trees within the city. In Kampala, it's evident every day. Someone drives, it's a, a small drizzle. Boom, the valleys are full of floods. It's uh, dust, uh, the sun is overhead at noon. You, can, you can't literally walk, it is hectic. It is, there's a lot of fatigue. So uh, the politicians, have also had a mindset shift in regards to that. I'll talk fiscal for Kampala. I am privileged to say that we have the support of the, at the nation at national level. Um, right now, the, at the ministry level, actually, with the work Kampala is doing, the Ministry of Water and Environment, Forest Sector Support Department, are going to review the pol forestry policy in Uganda, and they're going to set urban forestry as part of their agenda in the next review. So there is, uh, so this has, with, with what Kampala is doing, people uh, earlier on were not appreciating, but with now the awareness creation where the dialogues we are undertaking, the workshops we are undertaking, bring in main stakeholders, mm -hmm. try and shape their thinking to have a paradigm shift from, you know, mm -hmm. this is just about buildings, roads, mm -hmm. the, uh, how best is the, pav the, the, the pavers, how best does the road be marked? No. The beauty of a city lies with its green, this lush green cover. And so, yeah, the politicians have changed. I'll say for Kampala in specific, the Lord Mayor of Kampala City has been a champion. Uh, I don't know if time permits me, but I had a six minute video on how the local politicians and the local people are driving the agenda of tree planting within the city. But I don't know if uh, that is within our time. If it's there, I'll play it. I'll share the video live here so that people appreciate that. Sorry, I missed it in my presentation, but I, I wanted to present it earlier on. What, what we'll do, I think, is if you send me the link to it, we can make sure we send... If, if you got a link, it's on YouTube or something? Mm, it's, not on, it's not on YouTube yet, uh, but we shall put it on YouTube. I'll ask our 
media team at the, at city, at this, at the city hall to put it on YouTube. I, I definitely want to make sure that everyone can mm -hmm. see it. Mm -hmm. And I think we can find a way of incorporating it into the recording of this and mm -hmm. we can uh, send yeah. it to everybody out there. So yes, please, please, when you've got something, send me the link because I yeah. think people would so, love to see so it. Yes. So the Lord Mayor, thank you. The Lord Mayor is championing it. He's at the helm of it. He's, actually, he's the ambassador of Greening in Kampala. So we have the political, the politicians. And that has a ripple effect up to the lower LOC one. Actually, the community resistance, as when we're doing the audit, is very minimum. Someone asked that question within uh, that how is the community uh, reacting to this? It's minimum. Actually, as we are auditing, we are sensitizing them. You know, we are sensitizing them. Like this tree you see here is this edge. This is this edge. And the feedback they give us like, how did you know? Because they planted it. So as we apply the science to tell them that this tree is this old, then they feel amazed, like, oh, you know it yet you don't live here, how did you know? So they tend to appreciate that there is a lot of professionalism being applied to the level of work that KC is doing, and hence the less resistance. Thank you very much. So education, communication, fantastic. Um, look, we had loads of questions we haven't had time to get through. As always, we'll make sure our presenters receive a list of all of the questions afterwards, and then it's entirely up to them. They may be able to work through and, and respond to some stuff. If you've got anything particularly you'd like me to send through, please do email me, john at trees.org.uk. And I always love hearing about arboriculture in uh, other countries. So please send me your stories and send me your, your stuff, and I'd love to chat to you. I really would. Um, last question. It's the question we love to ask. It is, of course... What is your favorite tree book? I will ask you first, Kathy. Uh, the Useful Trees and Shrubs of Uganda. That's my big greatest love, that book. Brilliant. Okay, that's a good answer. And it's definitely a new one. We haven't had that one before. Everyone always says, please tell me what the names of the book were. We will make sure we have them uh, listed underneath the recording. Pade, your favorite tree book? Uh, my favorite tree book. Uh, fortunately, it's just coming out uh, with uh, by the Aboriculture Association, the one you showed earlier on there, trees <laughs> and fungi. Mm -hmm. We have a problem of fungi in the city. And so, hence also an explanation as to why we have less old trees. Actually, when the mining plan finally comes out and is shared across board with all the stakeholders, uh, you'll see, you'll, you'll appreciate the causes of these health conditions, declining health. Realize we have a problem of fungi. And so we are very much interested in exhausting the knowledge of fungi so that would better protect our trees. Good. Well, that, that is the best uh, promotion for our fungi books that I put behind <laughs> my head thinking that people would see them, that I forgot that my hair is now so much like a sort of helmet that you can't see anything that's behind me. But anyway, good link, Pally. Thank you. Yes, the fungi books are available. Um, great answers. You have both been wonderful. And I, I do say this kind of thing a lot, but honestly, such inspirational projects. Thank you both so much for sharing them and for your time and for your, your passion and your knowledge. Uh, it's been absolutely great. And um, thank you to all of you watching. Uh, uh, we hope we'll see you next week for an evening with Ted Green. Uh, it's not, it's only going to end in, interestingly, so who knows what's going to happen there. Fungi Symposium, buy your tickets, get your books over there. Please stay in touch. There was one question about setting up an East African network of arboriculture. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I've got no doubt at all that Kathy and uh, mm -hmm. Paddy are going to be all over that. We'd obviously love to be involved as well. Um, and uh, the whole tree family around the world, thank you all so much. Have a lovely evening or rest of the day, wherever you are. See you next week. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you much, thank so much, everybody. You. John, Pade, Sophie.